visual effects create the magic that makes people want to go to the movies. Movies are special effects. We start with an empty frame. Anything is possible. As audiences see through the illusion, the bar just raises. How do we do this now? How do we make this look great? I leave it to the geniuses at ILM. It's right there in the name industrial light and magic. The history of ILM goes way back. When I was writing Star Wars, there were no special effects houses in the world. So how are we going to do the effects? I realized that I was going to have to start a company. We didn't really know what we were doing. We were not movie people. George wanted a bunch of guys who didn't know what was impossible. We were departing from convention. We had to build equipment from scratch. This was a long shot. We make it look like a professional movie instead of a bunch of kids having fun. We realized nothing is impossible. There was just something here about the people. Suddenly, everybody wants to come to ILM. We were trying to do things that have never been done before. Oh, I don't know. I'm making this up as I go. They're pushing technology forward. There's so many innovations that ILM made. Digital editing, computer graphics. We developed Pixar to be a cartoon company. One thing led to another. It turned into Photoshop. Now you could manipulate images. Visual effects would never be the same again. I remember that incredible feeling when all you've got is an idea. It was so exciting. I want to work with people that inspire me. That is the spirit of ILM. And it goes back to that original group that were unpretentious, brilliant people. That was our family. We enjoyed each other's company. Yes, we water slided. Yes, we were immature. But nobody worked harder. We were the Rebel Alliance. Yeah! I can grab some for you. You know, I was watching... Yeah on Disney Plus, the Industrial Light and Magic documentary, the new one called Light and Magic. Have you seen it? Done by Ron no, Howard? No. Okay. You have to see it because it's so inspirational. Whether you have any sort of affection for these movies or the effects is almost irrelevant because it, what it really is is about artists dis determined to deliver and re uh, revolutionize the system in which they're working, artistically speaking, and it's just really fantastic. But there is a shot of them testing out the Max Rebo outfit you know and i think it's oh, phil tibbet who climbs in it and starts doing it and they they play stevie wonder i think it was suspicion for him to kind of do the body test yeah, yeah. so <laughs> they're filming it to see how it moves and reacts and that's the music that they were playing and so oh, how right. did it yeah you you're a skilled performer who would come off the dark crystal but how did it fall to you for that specific role was that just a stroke of luck or were they it's 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 a combination of luck, but also you mentioned Phil Tippett. I think there was an idea that Phil, I was told by, I think his sort of assistant, sort of co-worker, Dave Carson's, I think Phil wanted to be in this. Mm -hmm. And then he tried to get in it or just thought, no, it's not practical. And then I was just being rather disillusioned with a puppet I'd been given um, for the Jabba, Jabba's palace scene. Which was it? Um, what was called, the what was called, the puppet that he was? He's called Six Six, mm. and he's like a purpley brown slug like character with six eyes and six arms, um, who was on the floor of. And there wasn't a lot I could do with him as a puppet, um, and I think also George Lucas liked the puppet, but Richard yeah. Markman didn't. So Markman kept on trying to shove him out of shot or exclude him from shot. And George was saying, put him back in. Anyway, in the middle of all this, they said, why don't you come up into the, the puppet room uh, and, and have a look at, we've got something possibly for you. And then, you know, I looked at Max Rebo, bright blue Max Rebo, and it was love at first sight. Yeah, I thought, yes, I've got to get in that. Absolutely. Yes, he's did, wonderful. Did you know yeah. what did you wouldn't did you know what Max's purpose was at the time? You just thought, hey, he looks great. I'll do it. Or did you well, know he's no, going to be I, a band centerpiece? So they said he's in he's playing the keyboards and he was kind of a puppet because you come into the puppet from underneath. And so the bottom is kind of um, there's a kind of big hole um, where you come up. And it was obvious. I think already they told me, but it was kind of obvious that his arms were actually his legs. He didn't have arms and he was playing the organ with his feet, his legs. So I just thought, yeah, I love that idea. <laughs> so of course, when, when, the, um, when the toys start 
to come out and there's this Max Rebo that's got four limbs. I thought, oh, that's really disappointing. But they've altered but it. Thank, yeah. Thankfully, well, there are all these, these um, articles now online showing the genesis of Max Rebo, uh, how he was two-legged from the word go, and there are various previous iterations. There are actually going to be two puppeteers inside, kind of side by side at one point, a bit like the, the left and right uh, arm of Jabba. But that, right. would have, that, that would have resulted in a much bigger puppet, I think, to get two people side by side. Yeah. I, lo I love how Toby Philpot signs his Jabba the Hutt uh, eight by tens, left arm and tongue of Jabba or something like that. It is a little, <laughs> he specifies, I'm the left arm and I'm the guy that bats three C-3PO. But in this documentary, what's interesting, you, I believe that's absolutely true what you were told. Tibbet is playing this thing and Tibbet looks like he loves it, you know? Yeah. And, He's he's probably one of the more heartwarming elements of this documentary. He talks about how his work probably with his suffering from being bipolar kept him from committing suicide. Oh, and he wow. also Yeah, and so it's Star Wars he credits with saving him because it kept him so busy he would bounce from a puppet or do the rancor and then he'd be building a model and then he'd be doing some kind of effect and he his daughter got to a point he says in this documentary to tell you how touching it is. His daughter got to a point where she loved playing with toys and dolls. And she said, you know, I think I'm too old to play with toys, dad. And she was depressed about it. Like it, society was making her put down what she loved. And his response was, well, if you make movies, you never have to grow up. And it's absolutely true with all of us. You know, you don't you don't ever have yeah. you can you can kind of keep tapping into. I mean, you're still Max to hundreds of thousands of fans when they see you, Simon. Yes, although I now have a rival, though, from the book of Boba Fett. There's another what? puppeteer who is in, yes, there's Max Rebo appears, and it's not me. So they would have filmed it during a, in a virtual studio somewhere in LA, I think, during lockdown. And even if they'd thought to ask me, would I like to do it, I wouldn't have been able to get on a plane right. and get to America. But yes, I'm, I was a bit disappointed to not be asked or contacted at all. No, no. So. I think you should have been contacted, but I will. Let me let me help you with that a little bit. The reason he's in Book of Bobo Fett, Simon, is because your performance was so stellar the first time around. They remembered it and had to bring him back. <laughs> so it's it's all credited to you. Had you dogged it, it's, if it was... It's the character. It's the character more than the... Well, it's both. It's the character and the performance, I suppose, but... Your road to redemption is paved with tombstones. No quarter, kill all masters. Go to no quarter, killallmasters.com. Read it R.